Thank you so much for joining us today for Is Territory Sacred? Unexpected Kabbalistic Teachings in the Age of Religious Conflict with Dr. Nathaniel Berman. And we are honored to be partnering with HEA in Denver on this program today. So I would love to pass it over to Morty to introduce today's guest speaker. Shalom, everyone. My name is Mordechai Kedavitz. I am the Engagement and Programming Coordinator here in Denver, Colorado at the Hebrew Educational Alliance. We are 91, soon to be 92 years old in the next uh, coming uh, months, coming October. Uh, so we're a very proud synagogue. Actually, I grew up in this synagogue in, in when the old days in Denver. And uh, have, I like to brag about our congregation because uh, I have known all four of our senior rabbis over the course of our uh, history. So it's a wonderful shul to be a part of. Uh, so, and we're also pleased to be partnered with Valley Beth Midrash. Uh, we are pleased to present today our guest uh, speaker, um, Nathaniel Berman. Uh, Nathaniel Berman is the uh, Rachel uh, Varnhagen Professor in uh, Brown University's Department of Religious Studies. Uh, he is also the author of Passion and Ambivalence, Colonialism, Nationalism, and International Law, and Divine and Demonic in Poetic Mythology of the Zohar, the Other Side of Kabbalah. Uh, so uh, we are uh, pleased and uh, to present and welcome uh, Nathaniel Berman for today's program, uh, and also again welcome to all of you. Nathaniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Morty, uh, and thank you to Valley Beit Midrash for inviting me. Thank you to Alex for all the work you've done on this, and to uh, Rabbi Shmuley, who I don't see on the screen, but I know is uh, always there behind the scenes on all these events, and is a wonderful. A teacher and and uh, inspiring figure in our community. Um, so today we're going to study some texts relating to uh, the sacredness of land and also relating to territory. Uh, and I uh, differentiate between those the words land and territory. Territory implies ownership or sovereignty. Uh, and we're going to somewhat look at that relationship between the holiness of land on the one hand and the ownership of land or the sovereignty over land on the other hand. Uh, we're going to do that somewhat obliquely because we're going to plunge now into uh, traditional texts. Uh, and despite the title, it's going to be probably equal doses, uh, Midrashic texts uh, and a Kabbalistic work, the Zohar, which I will introduce uh, a a as I go along. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to put my PowerPoint on the screen and I'll pop back in from time to time. And I'm going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, so here we go. Here comes the PowerPoint. Um, so here we are. Um, our title is, Is Territory Sacred? Unexpected Kabbalistic and Midrashic Teachings for an Age of Religious Conflict. Uh, the image you see on the screen is uh, a painting by El Greco, 16th century painter of Mount Sinai, and I found it to be a particularly interesting uh, in mood and depiction uh, of, of, a, of a mountain, both sacred and, and a little bit frightening. Um, and uh, we'll see how that works as we go along. So farewell to El Greco, and here we go into the... Jewish text. Now I'm going to start with a very unexpected Midrashic text uh, that I call the sacred, comma, territory, comma, and the first murder. The sacred, territory, and the first murder. And this is a text from a well-known Midrashic collection, uh, Breshit Rabbah. It's a collection of a Midrashim, of legends and homilies uh, gathered up around the fifth or sixth century um, and uh, uh, collecting material from, from various times in the past. Uh, it's one of the most widely used uh, Midrashic collections. And so this is about the first murder. And Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field. That's uh, from Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. Now, the Midrashic author says, imagines, they said, come, let's divide up the world. So what did they argue about? One said, the holy temple is built on my side of the border. The other said, 
The holy temple is built on my side of the border. Because of this, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And so the Midrashic author sees the very first murder as a conflict over sacred land. Right? And it's, it's interesting. In this version of the Midrash, it doesn't say will be built. It actually says Nibne, which can be translated either as is built or was built. So they're imagining the temple's already there this, this, in this version of the Midrash. And they're arguing about, about that land. Who has sovereignty over that land? Who has ownership over that land? And this is the first murder. It's a very, very striking Midrash. Um, and I think this would be a good time to say the following. Um, I'm going to talk to you for 40, 45 minutes. I'm going to give you a very selective group of texts, very selective, unexpected texts. There are many expected texts that we could do, and we could spend six or seven months instead of 45 minutes. I'm going to give you some unexpected texts, uh, and they will be selective. Uh, and I just want to sort of advertise that right up front. Of course, we know about the tales of the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and so on and so forth. I'm going to give you texts that um, present a, a, an unexpected perspective coming out of very canonical, uh, canonical Jewish texts that I think could provide some enlightenment, edification, uh, 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 instruction, inspiration for our time, which is, uh, as so many times in the past, a time of religious conflict over land in all parts of the world. Uh, the other thing I want to say in preface is that I'm not going to be teaching any, or maybe with one exception, any halachic text. So this is a this is from Jewish legend and myth and teachings and mysticism, not from Jewish law. And that would be a whole other a whole other set of teachings. Let's go back to our to our text. Again, the first murder, a conflict over sacred land. Who's on whose side of the border is the temple? Okay, let's plunge right into sacredness. What makes something sacred? What is sacred? How, what does it mean that say that land is sacred? And I call these readings the geographical universality of the human and the divine, or a selective sacred. And in a minute, I think you'll see what I mean. Also from a, a Midrashic collection, the Tanhuma. Uh, and this appears in a number of different versions. There's a version of this actually in the Talmud. This one goes like this. When the Blessed Holy One wanted to create Adam, he, the first human being, he began to collect the dust for the body of the first Adam from the four corners of the earth so that no one part of the earth might say, the dust of your body is not mine. I think this is, a, I guess say, this exists in a number of different versions in rabbinic literature. And this is an amazing idea that human beings are composed of the entire earth so that no one part of the earth might exclude a human being. Actually, this is actually talking about burial might say, we don't, I don't want you to be buried here because you're not from my, my country, right? This idea that, that humanity is universal it is composed of, of matter from the four corners of the earth. Again, a very, very striking, very, very striking uh, uh, midrash in the Jewish tradition. So this is about the universality, the geographical universality of humanity. And what about God? Well, here is a very, very famous verse that I imagine many of you are very familiar with from Isaiah 6. Holy, 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 the God of hosts, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Kadosh, 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 Hashem tzvaot, melocha aretz kivodo. And uh, many of you might know that uh, observant Jews recite this many times a day, uh, probably mm, at least four times a day, uh, really observant Jews. Um, it's part of a, a mystical vision of God by the prophet Isaiah. Right? And this is the idea that the whole earth, the whole earth is filled with God's glory. So what would sacred land mean if the entire earth is filled with God, with divine glory? What would it mean to say there's sacred, something as like sacred land? Now, here's a chapter, a little excerpt from uh, Psalms 24, which maybe sort of puts the, the paradox or the tension right out there. 
this is a, a well-known verse, a uh, psalm. It's recited in high, high, high holiday liturgy. It's also recited every Sunday morning. Um, and it goes like this. The earth is God's and the fullness thereof. The world and the dwellers within it. Okay. But then when we get to verse 3, it says, Who shall ascend the mountain of God? And who shall stand up in his holy place? And then it gives some criteria, one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And it goes on, someone who hasn't uh, taken God's name in vain and sworn uh, 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 needlessly. Uh, one who has clean hands. So we have in this, we have a tension here between this idea that the earth is God's and the fullness thereof. And the other hand, that there's such a thing as a mountain of God, Har Hashem, right? That only some people are entitled to go to. And the tension there is right there. Now, note, there's nothing here about sovereignty yet. This is just really about sacredness. The earth is God's, but there's a holy mountain that only some may, uh, may have access to. Now, here I want to put this, this issue that I uh, started with, and I want to put it out front and center. I call this uh, little reading, Territory versus the Sacred? In other words, is there a tension between the idea of sacred land and the idea of territory? The idea of territory meaning belonging to someone, either belong to a sovereign or belong to a particular person. Is there a tension between those things? And people who are uh, somewhat familiar with other traditions might know that certainly in some traditions, the if land is sacred, it must mean that no one can own it. <laughs> that in some traditions say, by definition, if the land is sacred, it belongs to no one. It can belong to no nation if it's sacred, if it's God's, right? That's not necessarily the Jewish tradition although there are elements of it in the Jewish tradition. But I just wanted to put that out there that the territory and sacred land are not necessarily, uh, the exclusive territory and sacred land are not necessarily, they don't necessarily uh, uh, go together. Okay. Now this is a text that many of you might know. It was one of the first things, the first excerpts from Rashi, the great medieval French commentator on the Torah, one of the first things that I learned when I was a child, it's actually the first Rashi, the first uh, commentary by Rashi on the first verse in Genesis. And he asked, why does the Torah begin with the account of the creation? It's a funny question because you think, well, begin at the beginning. And in the English translation, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. What, a, what better place to start? Um, Rashi goes on to say, maybe the Torah should have started with the first commandment. Why do we need this story? And here's Rashi's answer. It's a very curious answer. And again, this is the first, first commentary by Rashi on the Torah. For should the peoples of the world say to Israel, you are robbers, because you took by force the lands of the seven nations of Canaan, Israel may reply to them, all the earth belongs to the Blessed Holy One. He created it and gave it to whom he pleased. When he willed, he gave it to them. And when he willed, he took it from them and gave it to us. And this commentary stops there, it stops there, right? Now we could add, of course, to that, and when he willed it, he took it away from Israel and gave it to Babylon, gave it to Rome, gave it to all the many conquerors of the land, right? So this is the idea that it's precisely because the land is God's or the entire earth is God's, that territory is only provisional, that human ownership or human sovereignty over territory is only ever provisional precisely because the entire earth is belongs to God. So there's a tension there between the idea of territory and the idea of sacred land or the idea of land that in some way is belongs to the divine or is in the province of the divine, a tension there. Um, and that kind of tension occurs all over the Bible, all, all over the Hebrew Bible, all over the Tanakh, where God says, you have the land, but it's really provisional. And if you don't do justice, 
the land will throw you out, or I will throw you out of the land, or the land will throw you out. And in fact, uh, uh, traditional Jews recite uh, a chapter from the Bible, that's the second parsha of the Shema, uh, at least uh, three times a day, uh, and sometimes more often. This idea of the provisionality of it, and that is that tension between sacred territory or 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 territory belonged to somebody because it's sacred and its sacredness, which presumably derives from the divine. So that tension between territory and the sacred, let's go on. And again, as I say, these are not only perhaps unexpected texts, but I know that I'm probably giving them somewhat unexpected interpretations. Okay. Now, before we get to what might be expected, which is that in Judaism, the land of Israel is sacred, Jerusalem is sacred, the Temple Mount is sacred. I wanted to give you some unexpected perspectives, which I call the unknowable location of the sacred and this question of unknowability. And here I start with a text that is familiar to many of you uh, about the burning bush. And so this is from Exodus. This is when uh, Moses uh, has fled Egypt because he uh, killed an e Egyptian uh, overseer, and he ends up uh, meeting this uh, uh, priest of Midian and marrying uh, one of his daughters and becoming a shepherd. Okay. Now Moses, tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, or Horeb, the mountain of God. So this idea that, that Horeb is the mountain of God is interesting since in the Psalm that we read, we most people presume that that mountain of God is actually uh, uh, Mount Moriah, the, the, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, uh, rather than this mountain in, in the middle of the desert. And yet they're both called the mountain of God. They, actually there it's called the Har Yudhe the mountain of Yahweh. Here it's the mountain of Elohim. Um, maybe that's the difference. Okay, I'm going to go on. A messenger of God appeared to him, or an angel of God appeared to him in a blazing fire out of a bush. And the, the word here for bush is something very low, like scrub brush, something very lowly. He gazed, and there was a bush all aflame, yet the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. Why doesn't the bush burn up? When God saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he answered, here I am. And God said, do not come closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, I say and compare Joshua 5, 13 through 15, because there's a very similar scene when Joshua is in front of, uh, is, is, is right before the battle of Jericho. And Joshua meets this mysterious stranger and the stranger, who's some kind of angel, says to him, he said, the stranger actually says, I am the commander in chief of the armies of God. Um, but, the but this guy says to him the same thing. Take your shoes off your feet, because the place on which you stand is holy ground. Uh, holy land, holy ground. Now. One of the interesting things to me about these scenes and something I really love about these scenes is that we have no idea where these, where these places are. The question of where Mount Choreb, Mount Sinai is, is completely unknown to us. Uh, there's speculations, maybe it's near the St. Catherine Monastery, maybe it's not. Um, it's certainly not the case that there's a Jewish tradition about where Mount Sinai is, right? So Mount Sinai, in fact, there's a, a Midrash uh, in the uh, in the Talmud that says that Sinai was chosen precisely because it was not remarkable, because it was a humble, lowly mountain um, that kind of goes along with this idea of the lowly bush out of which God appeared to Moses. So this land, this ground that Moses walked on was holy ground, and he had to take off his shoes. Now, where is this ground? We don't know. How do you know, let's say you go to Sinai, the Sinai Desert for vacation, how do you know that where you should be walking? Maybe you should be actually don't have your shoes on at all in Sinai. Right? How about Joshua standing in front of Jericho? And the angel says to him, take off your shoes. It's holy ground. Basically the same words. 
right? We don't know where that is. It's really striking that these two scenes where an angel says to a human being, Moses and Joshua, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. It's precisely that holy ground that we have no idea where it is. We have no idea where it is. Could be anywhere, right? Could be outside your door. Could be inside your door for that matter, right? This idea that holy ground could be anywhere is a very striking feature of these of these two scenes with Moses and Joshua, and really does give a different perspective on the question of what counts as holy land and what is our relationship to it, let alone ownership or sovereignty and so forth. Now, this is our first passage from the Zohar. Now, a one minute introduction to the Zohar. The Zohar is a vast collection of writings that are uh, written in Aramaic, and were probably written in Spain, mostly in Castile in the late 13th century, mostly say between 1270 and 1300 in Castile. Some of it was written earlier and some of it was written later, but mostly in that place by a number of different people. Um, and after the Zohar was, began to circulate and was compiled, it became the basis for all future Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, um, and all all Kabbalah that comes after the Zohar is in some way a commentary upon it. And it's a very, very beautiful work uh, that uh, once you begin to love it and study it, it's hard to read anything else. Uh, and you really have to force yourself out of it. It's very beautifully written. It's very poetically written. Um, and uh, we have a wonderful translation uh, in the Pritzker edition uh, by Danny Matt and Joel Hecker and Nathan Walski uh, but uh, the Aramaic is is really uh, quite amazing. And sometimes I sometimes read the Aramaic to my students, even when they don't speak any Aramaic, just so they can hear the poetry. But I think here probably I'll just limit ourselves to the English. Okay, and 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 usually there are these stories, and then the Kabbalistic discourses and homilies uh, are spoken by characters within the story. But here I'm really gonna, in a way, I'm going to focus only on this story. And here it goes. Rabbi Abba was traveling from Tiberias to his father-in-law's castle. And you, you get the feeling here of a fairy tale, right? This idea that his father-in-law had a castle is really cool. And oh, by the way, one more thing I should say is that although it was written in Spain in the late 13th century, its literary setting is in the land of Israel of the second century. And uh, many of the sages in the Zohar are uh, uh, well-known figures from that period, the second century in the land of Israel. Okay, Rabbi Abba was traveling from Tiberias to his father-in-law's castle, accompanied by Rabbi Yaakov, the son of Rav. They came upon Kfar Tarsha. Now, Kfar Tarsha, uh, uh, in, uh, as uh, Daniel Matt reminds us, literally, it means clod village, like a clod of, of earth. But Tarsha literally means a clod of earth. Um, and I think that in colloquial uh, uh, American English, the right translation would be the middle of nowhere, right? They came upon this village really in the middle of nowhere. It couldn't be a more undistinguished name than Kfar Tarsha, clod village. Now, this story goes on for many, many pages, because as I say at the bottom of the slide, they discover in Tar Kfar Tarsha that the entire village, including the children, speak only of the deepest and highest Kabbalistic secrets. And they spend some time there and they just, they're just they just amazed at how this whole village seems to be filled with Kabbalists. And it's in the middle of nowhere. And at some point they turn to the villagers and ra they say this, Rabbi Abba said, since you are so wise, why are you dwelling here in Kfar Tarsha? Why are you here in the middle of nowhere? You're like the greatest sages of my generation. They replied, if a sparrow or swallow is uprooted from its place, it doesn't know where to fly. This place has refined us for Torah. Our custom every night, we sleep half the night and we study Torah half the night. When we rise in the morning, fragrances of fields and glistening rivers enlighten us with Torah, which becomes settled in our mind. I'll just read the Aramaic here. V'chad anan kaimin b'tzafra, reche chakla, v'nahare maya, naharin lon oraita, v'it yeshvat biliban. So they live in this beautiful place in the middle of nowhere where Torah is, 
is beaming at them out of the fields and the rivers. Why should we go anywhere else? We know we're in the middle of nowhere. Why should we go anywhere else? So they go on and then they, they end up in, in one of the houses and they, they're, they're speaking mystical secrets all night. And it culminates with this, or this is one of the culminations of the story. It has been taught, in other words, a received story. All that day, none of them left the house and the house was enveloped in smoke. Words among them were fresh and joyous as if they were receiving Torah that very day from Mount Sinai. When they departed, they did not know if it was day or night. Now the Zohar, the Zoharic writers, they choose their words very carefully. They describe this house, this humble house, in the middle of a village with the most humble possible name, Kvar Tarsha, Claude Village, in the middle of nowhere. And it's Mount Sinai. You can get Torah in that little house, in that little village in the middle of nowhere. That's like getting Torah from Mount Sinai. It's just, if I didn't feel like I have so much more I want to say to you, I would just ask us all now to stop and breathe for five minutes. But you'll breathe later. Um, this house, this house is Mount Sinai, this little house. And they walk out, they, they're in the middle of nowhere and they know they've lost track of time. They're beyond time and space. And they're in the middle of nowhere and it's sacred land. Now, one of the reasons I say it's unexpected is because a lot of Kabbalah, including the Zohar, is very ethnocentric and sometimes extremely ethnocentric. And there's a lot of stuff in it that I don't like. There's a lot of stuff that's very uh, Jewish chauvinist and with a lot of bad things said about non-Jews and so forth that I really don't like. Um, and again, so I, I, I'm stressing here, I'm giving you a very selective group of texts, unexpected texts, and I'm not denying that the other texts exist. I just want to make that clear. You know, I'm an academic. I have to like cover all my bases here. I mean, I, actually just being an honest person, let alone an academic. Actually, I'm not sure if those are the same thing. Okay, let's go on. So that's Kvartash, Claude Village. It's like Mount Sinai. In fact, Matt, Matt actually translates this, this thing that I, I changed it to fresh and joyous. He has, instead of joyous, he has ecstatic. I, I, I don't want to go into the translations here. I think it's a little bit closer to the text, but uh, it, he, he really, he seems to have been as taken with this passage as, as I was, as many, as many uh, commentators have been. Okay. Now, of course, we all know that although I'm giving you a lot of unexpected texts, we know that there's a big strand of the Jewish tradition that says that some land is intrinsically sacred and we know where it is. So where is it? So perhaps this next text is the most expected text of all these texts that I'm giving. This is from the Midrash Tanchuma. And this is about the intrinsic sacredness of the land of Israel and Jerusalem and so forth. And I just thought it was important to give this text to balance some of the other ones. I, I love the beginning of this. And it, it's actually much longer, but I'm just giving you a little excerpt. Just as a navel is set in the middle of a person. I just love that line. So the land of Israel is the navel of the world. Anyway, we could talk a lot about that. The land of Israel sits at the center of the world. Jerusalem is in the center of the land of Israel. The sanctuary, in other words, the temple is in the center of Jerusalem. The temple building is in the center of the sanctuary. The ark is in the center of the temple building. The foundation stone out of which the world was founded is before the temple building. So this is the very essence of a of a of a intrinsically a text proclaiming the intrinsic sacredness that it's not just the land of Israel is is sacred because it is the navel of the world it is the place out of which the world was created right and the foundation stone which is on the Temple Mount right is the thing upon which the entire world rests so there's both an image here of a sort of a geological image of the foundation stone and the world resting on it and obviously an organic image of birth with land of Israel as the navel. And this is the idea of this intrinsic sacredness of the land of Israel, of Jerusalem, of the Temple Mount, of the Temple, and so forth. Moving forward in time from this Midrash Tanhuma, say fourth, fifth century, oops, here we go, 18th century. Now this is a quote from uh, Rav Nassim of Nemirov, who was the principal student of Rav Nachman of Bratzlav. People on this call, some of you may have heard of Rav Nachman of Bratzlav. He was the grandson of the founder of Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov. 
And to my mind, the greatest uh, Hasidic writer, uh, he was known for writing stories, really beautiful, complex stories, uh, as well as very, very uh, uh, astonishing Kabbalistic and Hasidic homilies. And he was buried in Ukraine in a city called Uman. Right? And some of you might know that uh, followers of his, his, uh, his way to this very day go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah for the Jewish New Year. Um, and it's become quite a, a scene there with thousands and thousands of people, uh, a little bit out of control. Uh, but this is about his burial. Rav Nachman was buried on Wednesday, the fifth day of Sukkot in 18, in 18, uh, I can't remember the day, the date of his, of his death, but, uh, in the first decade of the 19th century. Countless times in his life, we heard from his holy mouth that he chose to be buried in the city of Uman. He told many people that he thought Uman was a good place to be buried because of the many martyrs there. It was a good place to be buried because of the many martyrs there. Many people had been killed there because they were Jewish. This was the main reason he moved to Uman a half year before his passing. Now, and somewhat at odds with that is a continuation of the same paragraph. This is again by his principal student. Rav Nachman came in peace and was laid to rest in the place prepared for him from the six days of creation to engage there in tikkun olam, repairing the world for generations. Now there's a tension here between saying that Uman is holy because of the martyrs and that's why he wanted to be buried there and saying, no, actually, it was already from the six days of creation, from the beginning of time, that was the place prepared for Rav Nachman's burial, that it was intrinsically sacred from the six days of creation. And Rav Nachman wanted to be buried there because it was there that he could, after his death, I guess, engage in tikkun olam, in repairing the world. And somehow after his death, doing work on behalf of the world from his grave. Right? Now, Uman is not in the land of Israel, right? And it is this striking phenomenon of tens of thousands of people converging on Uman, many of them coming from Israel to go to Ukraine for Rosh Hashanah, one of the holiest days on the Jewish calendar. Very, very striking. So the Tanhuma we saw was the, a classic text about the intrinsic sacredness of the land of Israel and Jerusalem and Temple Mount. This text, many, many centuries later, talking about the intrinsic sacredness of a very different place, Uman in Ukraine. And that was the place prepared for Rav Nachman's burial from the six days of creation to engage in Tikkun Olam. Now we're gonna come back to this question of why is this a good place to engage in Tikkun Olam as we go along. Now, briefly, we, uh, this is the one sort of halachic text. Does sacredness come and go? This is actually uh, a text from Maimonides, the Rambam, not a not a Kabbalist, uh, but the greatest Jewish philosopher, uh, rationalist philosopher, Aristotelian philosopher. And this is from his law book, the Mishnah Torah. And he says this, all territories held by the Jews who came up from Egypt and consecrated with the first consecration subsequently lost their sanctity when the people were exiled therefrom, inasmuch as the first consecration was due solely to conquest. Now, Menachem Kellner, who's one of the greatest uh, scholars of our time on Maimonides says this, it is evident from Maimonides' discussions that the sanctity of the land of Israel is a consequence of the commandments which obtain only in the land and is so far from essentialist that in the past this holiness came and went, so to speak. In other words, that it's not intrinsic to the land, it only has to do with the fact that there are certain mitzvot, certain commandments you can only perform in the land, and that that uh, uh, holiness can come and go. It's not intrinsic to the place. It's purely an artifact of certain kinds of ritual practices. Again, a certain kind of provisionality of the holiness. In the past, this holiness came and went. It's a great formulation from Kellner. Okay. These are gonna be the, our last two texts and our most mystical texts. So, Um, to paraphrase, is it Dante? To all the rationalists in the room, enter at your own risk. Or as it says at some point in the Wizard of Oz, when they're nearing the castle, that there's a sign that says, I'd turn back if I were you. 
and the cowardly lion runs away. Do you remember that? Anyway. I'll help um, abandon Eve Winter here. There that you go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so these are going to be very mystical texts that we're going to end on. And the theme is going to be finding the sacred in the non-sacred. Finding the sacred in non-sacred land. Or as the Grateful Dead sang, once in a while you get shown the light in the strangest of places if you look at it right. I see some, some people are smiling, so I, I can see some people know the, the work of Rabbi uh, uh, Hunter and his Hasidim, uh, the Grateful Dead. Okay, here we go. Finding the truly sacred and non-sacred land, two Zoharic stories. The first one is really a story. The second one is more of a myth. So here's a lot of Aramaic, but I'm not gonna read the Aramaic. This is the story of the desert, desert hermits. That is one of the more famous stories in the Zohar. Um, and here we go. Oops. And again, I'm just gonna give you the story part of the story. Most of it is homilies and discussions. I'm just giving you the story part of it but a very, very interesting part of it. Rabbi Shimon, who's the sort of the hero, the, the, the chief sage of the Zoharic literature, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon and his son, Rabbi Elazar, were traveling on the road along with Rabbi Abba and Rabbi Yossi. As they were going, and this is, by the way, uh, this is a typical of the Zoharic literature. In the Zoharic literature, all these stories, none of them take place in a house of study or in a synagogue they all take place either while they're walking on the road or they're far from home or they're in Claude Village or they're in a field. Uh, these people are always on the go and they always find their Torah, they find their teachings, their illumination, not in the house of study, not in the synagogue, but either on the road or in some very unlikely places. And they're often taught by very unlikely people, a donkey driver, an innkeeper, um, a, a child, all kinds of a whole village in the middle of nowhere of Kabbalists. Um, it's all about, in a way, the Zohar is about finding illumination in unlikely places. Uh, and when you think about it, let me actually maybe just maybe I'll, maybe I'll pop back in for a second. Think about this. The Zohar was written by a group of Kabbalists in Spain, mo most of it in Spain in the late 13th century. They wrote this work, and they set it as a literary device in the land of Israel of the second century. So they never refer explicitly to Spain. They just write it. They, they, they're totally in character, in fact. And very shortly afterwards, the idea began circulating that it was actually written in the second century in the land of Israel, and it had been lost for a thousand years, and somehow it was rediscovered in Spain, however, however that happened. Um, but just think of their consciousness, right? They're writing, they're in Spain, but they write about as though they're in the land of Israel a thousand or 1100 years earlier, right? So their whole project is about this tension between their, their, their view of the land of Israel as a holy land, their knowledge that they're in Spain, right? And they're also their knowledge that they are creating a whole new corpus of mystical literature. They know it's new, even though they feel like it's, they also feel like they're continuing something very old, but they know they're writing it, right? So that tension between sacred land and non-sacred land, between the old and the new, right? Between the fictional and the real is, is intrinsic to the whole project. And this story in a way is kind of a meta story about that whole tension that, that we all experience. As they were going, they came upon an old man who was holding a little boy. Rabbi Shimon lifted up his eyes and saw him. Now this lifted his eyes is something that uh, readers of the Hebrew Bible know that when people lift their eyes, they often see something magical. You know, they, they lift their eyes and they see the Mount, Mount Moriah, this Abraham and Isaac that was there before, but they didn't see it. So lifting your eyes often, often means a certain kind of, of insight. And they see this old man with a little boy, 
He said to Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Shimon said to Rabbi Abba, surely by this old man, new words are about to be ours. Okay. Again, this tension between the old man and the new words. He said to him, Rabbi Shimon said to the old man, where are you heading? The old man replied, he's got a long story. My abode was among those hermits of the desert, for we have engaged in Torah. That's where I live. I live in the desert, studying Torah with the hermits. And now I've come to the settled area, to the city, to sit in the shade of the Blessed Holy One on the days of this month, the seventh. Now, some of you may know that the seventh month in the Jewish calendar is Tishrei. It's actually the first month. It's also the seventh month. It's where Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot are. So they come to the city for the holidays of Rosh Hashanah and so forth. Rabbi Shimon said to him, by your life, we shall hear a word from your mouth of those new old words, which is one of the great Zoharic phrases, new old words, milin chadetin atikin, that you planted there in the desert. Now, of course, there's another paradox here because the desert is a place where you can't plant anything. So we're going to hear the, the fruit of a paradoxical planting, the planting in the desert. Now, what else is in the desert? As we all know, Mount Sinai. It's probably the most famous desert in the biblical, in the Jewish imagination, right? So this guy lives in the desert. He's planted words of Torah in the desert. And now Rabbi Shimon wants to hear it as he heads to the city. The old man replied, we have withdrawn from the settled area to the harsh desert where we study Torah. Now, he now explains there are two reasons. Now, in these last three lines, there are two reasons that are almost opposites. In order to subdue that side, the demonic other side, so the old man is saying, the desert is the domain of the demonic realm, the realm of the devil, the realm of the demonic, and we are there to fight the demonic. But then he says something almost the opposite. Furthermore, only there do words of Torah become settled. It's almost the opposite. Actually, the desert is the best place to study Torah. It's the in the desert where you can really grok the Torah, which you, the words of Torah really become settled in you. And there's a pun here, right? There's a pun because he opposes, he, he makes an opposition between the settled area, right? The settled area and the desert, right? The settled area is Yeshuva. And here he says, only there do words of Torah become settled, it yashvat. So although the desert is the opposite of the settled area, it's also the place of true, the place where a true sort of settling of words of Torah within a person can happen, precisely in the desert. For there is no light except that which issues from darkness. That's the only place you can find true light, is out of darkness. There is no worship of the Blessed Holy One except from darkness. There is no good except from evil. Therefore, the perfection of all is good and evil together, ascending subsequently as good. This is perfect worship, or perfect service of, of God. Okay. It's this very paradoxical uh, move that he's making, a paradox that he first says there is the desert and there is the settled area, Yeshuva in, in Aramaic. These are opposites, and the desert is a place of the demonic. And then he says, actually, it's only in the desert that words of Torah become settled within you, it yashvat. Right. And it's that paradox of finding the Torah in the unlikely place, finding the light in the darkness, finding God in the domain of the demonic, and so forth. Okay, totally scrambles our idea of what we mean by sacred land. What land is truly sacred? Is it the sacred land or is it the desert, the demonic realm, where that's the only place you can have actually really learn Torah? Okay, I'm getting to my last text. <laughs> I get very enthusiastic about my text. So sometimes I, I talk for longer than I plan to. Okay. Now, this last text, I'm, it's prefaced with a, a, where God says to Abraham, uh, Genesis 12, 1, the beginning of Parshat Lechacha, God said to Abraham, get thee from thy country and from thy birthplace and from thy father's house to the land I will show thee. So this is a, is a very, it's a turning point in history Right. It's the creation of the Jewish people, and it's very striking that it requires alienation. God says, get you out of your country 
didn't say the country of the nations or the country of the evildoers. Your country, Artscha, your birthplace, Mimolartcha, your father's house, Betavicha, to the land I will show you. He doesn't even name the land, right? So there's a God is telling Abram, you've got to alienate yourself in order to. I guess, come to the Holy Land. He doesn't call it the Holy Land here, but I guess that's the sense of it, right? That there's an alienation effect. Very, very striking feature of this origin of Jewish history that is very insistent. Abraham does not come from the land of Israel. He comes from, or Kastim, from Mesopotamia. And God says, you have to get out of your country, your birthplace, your father's house, to this other land. This idea of the wandering Jew is right there, not a product of exile, or perhaps exile is at the very birth of the Jewish people. Now, here we're going to finish up with this very mystical text from Zohar Hadash, uh, translated by Joel Hecker. Um, and it goes like this. this is, now we're going to finish up with this great teaching, and really very puzzling teaching, but I think beautiful. Come and see. When souls were created, they were garbed in a holy, sublime form of luminosity in the upper garden of Eden and in another holy form in the lower garden of Eden. They were also given a sublime heavenly inheritance and a celestial, a celestial portion. After this had been given to them, an angel says to them, time has come for you to depart. The blessed Holy One has said that you must leave. Astonished, the souls pleaded, where? In other words, why would we want to leave here? It's beautiful here in heaven. Upper garden, lower garden, Everything is luminous and beautiful and heavenly and divine. Well, why do we have to go anywhere? Two angels say to them, to the souls, the Blessed Holy One said, again, quoting from the command to Abraham, go you forth from your land, from your birthplace, from the house of your father to a land I will show you. And here that verse is being applied to the descent of souls to the earth. From your land, lower, from the lower of Garden Eden from the house of your father, from the upper garden of Eden, to a land that I will show you, to a dark baseland. In other words, our earth, the earth that we know. So that sounds bad. The, the idea that souls coming down to earth as an, an, not only an alienation, but a, a really a come down. Then the angels show the soul the entire garden of Eden. They show the soul palaces and houses, supernal chambers, numerous beautiful palaces, multifarious houses, diverse chambers, abundant rungs, the portion that each and every righteous person receives. And the soul asks, what are these palaces? Two angels reply, 42 palaces embroidered from numerous splendid colors. Whoever recites the Shema with a secret divine name of 42 names in the manner that befits the sacred name inherits them. In other words, the angels say to them, do you want all these rewards, these heavenly rewards? The only way to, to inherit those heavenly rewards is to be a human being on earth in the dark base land and to discover holiness and to be on the earth and to recite the Shema, which is probably the most famous Jewish prayer for pronouncing God's unity with a secret Kabbalistic intention, finding the 42 names in it in the proper manner and that is the way to discover holiness. It's precisely discovering it in this land, which is described as a dark base land. That's the place to discover uh, sacredness and holiness. And with that, I'm going to open it up. Thank you so much, Dr. Berman. Yes, feel free to uh, raise your hands if anyone would like to ask a question. Hi, Aglaya. Hi. So, all right, this is going to sound like a weird question. And so it's, and I'm kind of brain fried right now, but the short version of the story though is that, all right, so I read too much of these people like Voltaire and Montesquieu and Rousseau who are writing about you know, this perfect place where they're really talking about some sort of golden, like, you know, tabula rasa state that supposedly the Native Americans have, which is not 
true, but they're making this up like El Dorado is this perfect utopia and everything. So one thing that I am noticing is one, people tend to look back to the past about, you know, this, but they're also looking into these, um, you know, these places that are not, you know, civilized, not settled, all of that stuff though. And they're actually giving this impression that civilization messed up everything, which, you know, we can get into that all day. So here's my question, is it even attached to land at all? Like what is land in all of this? Uh, I, 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 uh, I was totally with you until actually the, the punchline of the question, but the rest of it was great. And I really, I'm really with you on that. So in a way, uh, it, you know, the, the first part of what you said is like really great because it it's precisely this, these unexpected teachings are all the opposite. They're all the opposite. They're all saying, no, don't, it's not, we don't, we're not longing for this perfect golden land that was lost, right? But it's precisely in the place that isn't the golden land. That's where you find the sacredness, right? So it's precisely in the middle of nowhere, in Clod Village, in the desert, in, right? So it it's, in the demonic realm, not in the perfect place, but in the other place. Um, and this, that kind of teaching is, which is really emerges out of very old Jewish teachings, as well as uh, Kabbalistic teachings in the Middle Ages, and then filters into the Hasidic teachings about, you know, it's and you can even interpret psychologically, it's precisely when you're in, one, one is in trouble psychologically, one is depressed, that's really where you can find the true holiness. It's like, it's hard, it's an ordeal, and it, it, it might be destructive, but on the other hand, if you can get through that, that's where you get the real ascent. There's a famous uh, Hasidic phrase, descent for the sake of ascent, Yeridah Tzarech Aliyah, right, which is all over the early Hasidic uh, literature um, and really comes from these Zoharic ideas about going into the desert and going into the demonic, and that's where you find the holiness. So in a way, it's the opposite of the, of the myth of the golden land that was lost. Um, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you got it though. Like it was basically though. Like it, there's a perception. There's a it's in the mind. Ultimately. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Dan. Hello. So I have. It's less of a question and more of just a thought I wanted to share. Um, I was looking at the the Exodus um, text, the Joshua text, and the Maimonides text. Um, I just thought it was interesting that it seems like and kind of a theme that you were talking about throughout everything else too, is that there's nothing like really intrinsic about land that makes it special in any way. It's just kind of how it's used and who the people are that like live on it. And through the actions of the people that live here, it like becomes special in its own way. Um, I just think that's really interesting speaking to the power that we have like as individuals to like work to make the world better through our actions on these places of land that we live. I mean, I, you know, I, I think the thought is really beautiful. I, I, you know, in, in like, you know, in a way you could see a tension between these texts, right? Because Maimonides is really saying, there's nothing in, in, in I mean, and Kellner, this uh, Maimonides scholar is really emphasizes this in his work that Maimonides doesn't believe in intrinsic sacredness of any kind. Um, but in a way you could say the Moses and Joshua texts are a little bit different. They're saying this land is intrinsically sacred, but you don't know where it is. It could be anywhere. So that's a little bit different, right? To say like, this land is gonna be sacred because I'm gonna have my family on it and it's gonna become sacred to me because of what we do and what we love and what we build on this land is a little bit different than saying, I've come to the middle of nowhere and, it, and I've discovered without doing anything that it's sacred. I just don't know where, it's, where it is. There was a certain kind of tension between those two ideas, right? They both have an idea that there's no known place that's sacred, that's intrinsically sacred, but the Moses and Joshua texts are actually, you could be walking, you know, in the streets of, you know, Denver or Manhattan, and you might actually be walking on one of those places. If you could see the angel, they could say, take off your shoes, dude. You're walking on holy land, right? It's a little bit different. And it, it's a little bit different. It's an, it, it's an interesting tension. I, that's why I love those, those Moses and Joshua texts. Uh, let's take some more people. Um, I, don't, I don't know the order. I'm going to do it the order of my screen. Susan. Well, I wondered if Aglai wasn't really speaking more to um, land not being necessarily tangible in the sense of uh, the way it's presented here. But um, one of the reasons that this, uh, that I wanted to join this 
uh, class specifically was the title. And I thought that perhaps we were going to address the sacredness of Israel and the meaning of its territory. Um, but, but apparently I was wrong <laughs> in many ways. Uh, it seems like this is more uh, uh, related to uh, the spiritualness of, uh, of determining what is sacred, uh, which of course, uh, to me, Israel is. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I wonder if you would speak to that a little uh, in terms of uh, your beliefs, because you're a scholar on and have written on sacredness versus territory, how you view that. Well, I, I mean, I did give one of the key texts about the sacredness of the land of Israel, that Midrash about Israel is the navel of the world and Jerusalem is in the center of Israel and the Temple Mount. And so that is, uh, I, I'd say that is probably one of the most often quoted Midrashic texts about the intrinsic sacredness of the land of Israel. Um, and clearly it's conflicts over places like Israel, but also other conflicts over sacred uh, land around the world, which are the, is the motivation for this whole talk. Uh, and that's implicitly in the background. That's why I start off with that Midrash about how the very first murder <laughs> was about a conflict over who owned, you know, who owned the land that the temple was on, right? That's that was that first text that I that I did, the very that very first text from from uh, Rashi Uh Well, I think and, that's what yeah. I I'm wondering here is how then you feel uh, like if Israel is territory, is it uh, specifically? Jewish territory. Right. I mean, it, it encompasses so many different uh, religions, if you think of the Temple Mount, for example. But being a Jew and having my grandfather say to me, uh, Israel is so important. Um, you know, the existence of Israel is really, in my mind, he thought of that as the territory of Israel escaping Russia before World War II with his experiences. And so, um, you know, it, it's not that I'm arguing, it's not what I, I, I perhaps thought it was, but maybe looking for not just uh, something that, uh, I'm just curious, uh, I guess, uh, perhaps not just how you feel, but how everyone else feels. To whom does the territory belong? Uh, you know, I, I know how I feel. I'm looking for that uh, that uh, community, I guess, of thought a little bit. Yeah, no, I know. I your questions are obviously extremely, extremely important. I, I mean, I if we had a lot more time, I would love to explore further. I, I mean, since I know we're almost out of time, but let me just say that part of what I'm putting into question here is uh, the somewhat dissociating questions about sacredness of land from the question of territorial ownership or sovereignty, right? And that's certainly something that comes through from these kinds of texts that I'm talking about. Um, so that, you know, when, when the psalmist says, uh, when, 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 when Isaiah says, God, God fills the whole world, well, then how could any particular land be more sacred than others if God fills the whole world? The psalmist says, in the, the chapter from the Psalms that I give you, God, God owns the whole world and everything. And then immediately, two verses later, who, who's allowed to go up into the mountain of God? Right. So you have that tension there between the notion of universal sacredness of the earth and the notion of only certain people can ascend the mountain of God. And that's even... And if you read that whole psalm, there's actually no even reference to the Jews or Israel or anything. It's really about only, you know, truly righteous people can ascend the mountain of God. Um, and so there's that, again, it's, there's a tension there, again, a tension between the idea of the omnipresence of the divine on the earth and the idea of particular land being sacred. And both of those questions are different than the question of sovereignty. Right. And the Rashi quote says, actually, sovereignty is God's choice. God owns the whole world and he can give the land to whoever he wants and take it away from wherever he wants. Right. And so that 
there's a tension there uh, between sacredness and ownership, right? And I also started with this idea that there are traditions in the world that would say, if something is sacred, by definition, it can't be owned or, or can't be ruled by anyone. And uh, I'm thinking in particular of certain Native American traditions, but, uh, but not only. Uh, let's get some more, uh, what else we have here? Um, e. Moans, I don't know your first name. Hey, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I've heard you say a number of times, you know, about these tensions and like things being very paradoxical and stuff. Um, and those are some of my favorite spots to find um, in life. And I'm curious, what, what do you think about the paradoxical like nature of these things that you've been laying out? Do you find that as a particular like opportunity or doorway to, you know, some truth because often like when there is that sort of tension and contradiction, people are just like, oh, we stop there and that's kind of the end of the conversation. Um, good question. I mean, I'm really into paradoxes and ambivalences and complexities. Um, <laughs> so in partly it's just, you know, a personality quirk, but it's also anti-dogmatism. It's anti-dogmatism. Uh, if someone says this land is sacred to me and therefore you have to get off it or I'm going to kill you, that is not a paradoxical or ambivalent position, right? Um, the, the texturedness of the relationship between God and land, the divine and land and sacredness and human sovereignty, divine sovereignty and human sovereignty, divine universality, human universality, right? Those tensions uh, my hope is that when you can see the textured quality of that, that that is an anti-dogmatic perspective and that just because, for example, a piece of land is sacred to, to somebody doesn't mean that they have an exclusive ownership or sovereignty over it, especially when it's also sacred to someone else. Um, and as I say, although clearly from where I'm coming from and the way I grew up, uh, obviously the conflicts in the land of Israel are uppermost in my mind. Um, uh, I've written about and teach about conflicts all over the world. For example, uh, the city of Ayodhya in India where there's conflicts over, over a temple site between Hindus and Muslims, um, as well as the many conflicts over, over uh, land in North America that's sacred to a variety of Native American nations um, and the, the, in, where you really see, you know, you read about those conflicts um, and you really see the tension between different ideas about sacredness and how sacredness relates to sovereignty and how sacredness relates to ownership, like, you know, like capitalist ownership, um, how those things relate to each other. And you really see the cultural clashes and you begin to see that these things don't necessarily come together. They don't, a land could be sacred without ownership. Right. Or you could have ownership, but not sacred. Or there's all there's all kinds of ways in which these things come together, and it's both, I, in my view, an anti-dogmatic position, but also lays open the possibility for resolutions of conflicts once you see the variety of stakes. We're trying, what's really at stake here? What's really at stake with sacred land? Uh, um, and again, all that is really different than than. Uh, uh, then, the, for example, the, the thing that Susan raised was that may, do the Jews need their own state for safety reasons? It's a completely different set of questions, right? And we could discuss that. It's a completely different set of questions than you should own this land because it's sacred, because God revealed himself, revealed himself for herself to your ancestors on this particular piece of land. And that was the point of the stories about, about the burning bush or about Joshua, which is God, you know, God says to these people, this land you're standing on is sacred, and there's no attempt to identify that land, and we have no idea where that land is. So you could be walking anywhere in the Sinai Peninsula, could be treading on that sacred ground without knowing it, right? And there's some angel there, and if you could only hear that angel or that God saying to you, what are you doing walking on this sacred land with your dirty shoes, right? Now, it's obviously nothing to do with ownership or sovereignty or anything. It is some, some, something else there. Something else is going on. Uh, Lenny. Um, yeah, thank you. I want to say I appreciate the way that you um, made the distinction between sort of the unexpected sources and the expected sources, because I think um, 
one of the things that often happens uh, in Judaism specifically, and I'm sure in other traditions as well, right, is the sources that tend to get most often repeated are often those that are most consistent with the cultures we live in. And so there's these assumptions about land and sanctity and colonialism and capitalism and these sort of structures of how people are trained to think that aren't necessarily the way our ancestors thought. And so looking at these sources that are coming out of very different worldviews and very different assumptions about land and power, I think is, is super helpful. So I really appreciate it. Um, are we gonna, are, are you gonna make available like these sources uh, so that we can see them in the future? Like, is there a way that we'll, we'll get access to them? Yeah, I just I just put my finishing touches on them right before the class, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll email them to uh, to Alex and I, you or you can email me. And I, I I'll share the PowerPoint, no problem. Um, uh, what what I wanted to say in response to the first thing you said is what I love about being immersed in the Jewish tradition, and I think this is true for any tradition that's been around for a long time, which there are many is people have thought so many different things, right? I mean, it's not only that joke, two Jews, three opinions, right? It's thousands of different perspectives. And that it's really the, um, you know, when you immerse yourself in a tradition, in an old tradition, you, you find a wealth of perspectives all directed on the same text. So you can take a particular text, say the, the text uh, uh, from, from Genesis about Abraham, right? That's been interpreted a thousand different ways over the last few thousand years, right? And you can, and thanks to the wonders of technology, it, with a snap of your finger, you can click, 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 and get, you know, many, many, many different traditions, uh, d interpretations over the centuries of the same verse. It's all these people all over the world interpreting these same verses, coming up with these different perspectives. Um, and I, again, I think that's what makes being immersed in the Jewish tradition so exciting is to find these differences, these unexpected sources. And there isn't just one perspective. And as I often tell my students, if anyone says, says, uh, starts to say to you a sentence that goes like this, Judaism believes that, you can stop them right there. You know that they're wrong. It doesn't matter what happens after that because there is no one Judaism believes that, right? Anytime I say Judaism believes that, I can show you a text where Judaism believes the opposite where some Jews believe the opposite, a canonical text. I promise you, I'm, I, 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 you, you know. So that sentence is almost always wrong, usually wrong, uh, no matter what follows the that, right? And that's what makes it amazing, right? It is so many different perspectives, unexpected things. In the Zoharic literature that I'm so obsessed with, there, there's such a range of perspectives, really diametrically opposed perspectives. And that's why I kept on saying, I'm giving you a very selected view, things that are, are unexpected, people wouldn't necessarily think are there. Uh, I see Toby a hand. Oh, okay, sorry, La last question, then we do have to end, unfortunately. Okay. Over our okay. Hi, Dr. Berman, I took a class from you a while ago. I don't expect you to remember, but it was incredibly memorable to me. It was on oh, thank you. Uh, and I'm wondering if you're teaching anywhere else or here again or anywhere where we can get hold of you. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I don't have uh, I don't have any public classes scheduled right now, uh, but uh, the best way to whenever I do, I put them on my Facebook page if you want to look there. Uh, I don't really have a mailing list, but um, I, I love doing this kind of teaching. Uh, uh, to uh, outside the university setting, uh, and I do it quite often. Uh, so just uh, you know, if if you're on Facebook, that's I usually post all of them there. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll keep checking for you. All right, and thank you so much for the feedback, Toby. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Doctor. All right, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you all so much for engaging with us. And Dr. Berman, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we will be meeting again next week at the same day on Thursday, uh, June 22nd at 1 p.m. Pacific to hear from Rabbi Tali Adler for her presentation, Crying with God, Suffering and Divinity in the Thought of the Aish Kodesh. So I hope that you can all join us again next week for that. And thank you all again for being here today. Have a great rest of your day.